Two weeks I honor the earth, Jesus, to come in your presence one more time, to give your glory, to give your honor, to give your praise. And as we gather together, Lord, Jesus, my Savior, to learn more about you, O oh God. Lord, there's a prayer to open our hearts, my God, our oh, mind in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, my Savior, Lord, you have to hide your word, O oh God, in our heart, that we sin at the Lord Jesus, I will grow day in your life in the mighty name of Jesus. Help us, O oh God, my Savior, that we come, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, my God, that we come broken before you, Lord Jesus. Lord, you said in your voice that the broken and the constant heart you have not And Lord Jesus, truly tonight, Lord God, we just want to, be, to know more about you in the name of Jesus. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us more like pray. Oh, God, cover us and give us the Lord. My God, my Savior, Jesus, cover us, my God, with peace. Cover us, Lord, Jesus, my Savior, oh God. Lord, God, my God, my God, cover us, Lord, Jesus. Within, without, in the name of Jesus. Lord, in our family, Lord, God, I pray. Lord, our children, Lord, God, the young people. Lord, in the name of Jesus, my God. Lord Jesus, put them out of our hands and Lord, in the name of Jesus, oh God. Some of you wandered far away, my God, but Lord Jesus, my God, and you will go chase after them. My God, my Savior, Lord, just go looking for the, the lost tonight. Oh Find them in the name of Jesus and bring them back into your home. My God, my Savior, cover us under your blood. Keep us safe, my God, I pray. As I look to you until the fans in Jesus' name. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna come now. Okay. Friday, June 17th. Tonight is Ask the Pastors. Amen. Ask the Pastors. The night that we all come together and we ask questions, biblical questions, which requires biblical answers, and as I've always said, that if there's a question that we can answer at this time, then we will go back and we will take a second look, research it, and come back with the answer. See, none of us know everything, but we do all we can do to answer every question biblically. Amen? So as we said last week, there's no question in the bad question. No question is a bad question. Uh, yes, they might be bad answer, the wrong answer, but a question was made to ask why, because we are seeking an answer. And even though it might sound kind of weird to the one who's listening, but this is how it appears to me. So what the one was clarity, when you ask them the question, because you want clarity. Those who are on Facebook, uh, if you have a question, you ask them, you text in your question, Amen. That we may hear and respond to you. Amen. Those who are, of course, on the Zoom room tonight, we welcome you. Amen. Welcome to you, Miss Mary, Minister Andrew. Welcome to the um, Amen. We welcome you, Mrs. Sakina. I welcome you also, uh, Minister uh, Keith Glenn, and also Pastor Miles and Elder Michael Brown. So God bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I'm going to step away. I'm going to be sure he has any music. You know, to miss a selection uh, before we get started. Blessings, we'll Bishop. Hello, Bishop. Um, he went to turn on last Oh, Minister Brown. Yes, I'm here. Are you at the, the control room of that? To no, I'm, I, I'm controlling the camera, but I don't want to do the music. You're, you're afraid to go. No, I said I, I'm controlling the camera, but I don't know how to do the music. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, get your answer, get your, your questions together. Get your questions together and let us get ready. 
and, and to shoot the question out. We have um, we have folks here tonight I can see who are, who have the ability okay, to answer questions. So do not be afraid to ask the questions. It doesn't matter how simple it is. Ask the questions. And tonight we will do all we can to provide the answers. Amen. God bless you. Amen. So I have a question and based on a discussion we were having this week. So in Revelation um, 19, verse 16, Revelation 19, verse 16, and he, 19, yeah, 19, 1, 9, verse 16. Nineteen, and it says, "Can you hear me, Bishop?" Uh, yeah, let's just, just give me the verse again. Revelation nineteen, verse sixteen, one. sixteen, one six. One, okay. Yeah, one six. Okay, nineteen, one six. Yes. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So, um. This week we were having a discussion and um, one person was saying that was a tattoo. Okay, Mr. Brown, honestly, you're, you're breaking up a little bit of that. Are you asking what is the meaning of the verse? No, no, no. I, there was a discussion. Um, sorry. I'm sorry. So there was a discussion I heard this week. And somebody was saying that that was a tattoo he had written on his um, on his thigh. So is was that a tattoo? That's my question. No, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely okay. not. Um, in fact, first of all, when we look at the chapter, um, and we look at the actual verse itself, the first thing we saw look at this, uh, he had on his vesture. Right. And what is a vesture? It's clothing. Yes. It's clothing. You know, it's so like the, that um, priest scars yeah. that, that they wear, that a bar uh, that they wear. Um, and on his thigh, on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lord. Now, we have discussed before that there are, that there are Northings and there are signs. Now, there are signs written on, 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 on their foreheads. If you have the Bible, everybody will talk about, you know, um, and there was a sign in their forehead written. Amen. So we have the mark of the beast, and then we have the mark of Satan, and the mark of Jesus Christ. So we who are sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ, you are sealed with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Are those of the mark of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, there's also the mark of Satan. You know, there are those who are marked. You can't do it You can't do it I see if it's Andrew's hand up. Amen. So, on his side, on his side, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lord. You remember when Jesus Christ was our crucified. And Pilate, they had they had the inscription written, Amen, from above his name. You know, Jesus is one of the Jews, Amen. We know that it was with us, right? in Jesus Christ, it was written. Remember now, this was John in a vision. John was now seeing it. This is a vision, and Jesus Christ was now being revealed. So I I do not believe it was a tattoo. So they say, but it may be now looking for now next to you. Amen. But I see this. I do not have the verse, but I found the verse. I wanted to know where the question was coming from. That's all. Okay. And they repeated, I think, Mr. Brown had said to me, she said that a discussion was what was made for God to. This verse, and he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written to one king and lords of the Lord. 
But my response was that a vesture is a garment, it is clothing. It is sort of like you know, a garb that somebody wears, but it covers their, you know, their, their body. And on his thigh, his thigh, the side, a name written, King of the Kings and Lord of Gods. Say, Bishop, if I may just jump in here for a second, and I fully understand what you are saying. However, let me draw it closer to the question. The question was, he had, let me actually read it. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh. So he had on both things, both his clothing and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the question was, was this a tattoo? Was it a tattoo? The answer is no. That's straight, answer, okay. right, I know, I know, but straight to the point, right? Straight to the point, the answer is no. And let me tell you why. Like you rightly said, a lot of people are seeking justification for what they did and what they are doing. Jesus Christ, God wrote upon tables of stone. He actually wrote, the finger of God wrote upon tables of stone. He, God, don't need no tattoo. God don't need any tattoo. He spake the word and it was done. We are born with ears, with fingers, you know. And like, I'm not going around in a corner. When folk mark up themselves and stuff like that, whatever you do previously and stuff like that, when you come to Christ, you're forgiven. Amen. You're forgiven. But don't try to use Jesus Christ to justify what you want to do. I'm not saying you, Bishop. You understand? I'm saying to the point. The answer is no. God don't have no tattoo artist. He spake and it was done. Join the meeting. Go ahead, man of God. Yeah, and you know, and also the other scriptures to back that up. Uh, you know, in First Corinthians three, verse seventeen, the Bible says, "If any man of God, we will be told last time about the body is the temple of the Lord." Body of the temple of the Lord. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. The temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? Yes. If we look at some folks out there, they're using their body as so called by the arts. Jesus never asked one of us to do this. And we can't justify it. Amen. They're destroying the temple of the living God by putting art and tattoos. Of, of, of animals and, and, and creatures and, and skulls and no, and no, no, it's not good, it's not right, it's not good. Um, in the book of Revelation, we see where he that sat on the throne had a book written within, and it was sealed with seven seal on the outside. This is not something that is sent to a printer, it was the word of God, as you rightly said. John visualize it. There are some times when we have to sharply review some individuals that are misleading people. We have to like sharply. No! Don't try to bring Jesus in that mess. Don't try to bring Jesus in that mess. That stuff is mess. Jesus speaks and it happens. So when he said he had a name written, Jesus spoke the word and his creation Telling who he was on his thigh and on. He's, Jesus is not into all that stuff. Men transgress and do those things. He wrote the Ten Commandments with his fingers. He can do exceeding and abundant above all we can ask or think. And there are some that are out there trying to mislead the church. But I want to warn you today. I want to warn. And I'm talking to that person. I know who I'm talking to. One word. Stop. One word to that individual doing this. S-T-O-P. This is a warning. It's a final warning. A final warning. Do not mislead God's church. This person that did it, be careful. Jesus don't have any tattoo as you rightly said, man of God. Uh, 
Hey man, I'm here. All right. What was that? Yes, very clearly. I mean, I ask elderly this question, but I like to ask them when I come on here for people who might have heard these things and also need clarification. So just to let it know, every question that I ask on here, I already ask, but I do it so others mm -hmm. may learn. I really appreciate that. Yes. And, you know, the fact that you said that, let me just throw that into everyone who's listening there. All who's listening right now, all who's listening. Is this something that anyone on this program thought was okay, thought was right, thought that the Ch that Jesus Christ agreed with? Anyone? Any thoughts, any comments? Okay, Bishop, let's say, okay, one of the other scripture that they knew, when no father says that um, God has a one in graph, in the car, in grave, and it comes with time. They'll do that and say, okay, it's engraved, so it's not good. So I have heard, you know, the same thing that Sister Holly is saying. And I said, no, Bobby, if God don't show you his hands, then you cannot take what's not good. You know, you cannot use that scripture to justify. Mm -hmm. So I'm on point with you guys. Yeah, it's not misleading people. Thank you. Stop driving it. Thank you, woman of God. Yes, we make errors. And we, in our sinful state, we, in our ignorance, do things that later, later, we regret. I have had so many regrets. I don't have any more. I say I had, because once I become a new creature, once I'm in Christ, those is not me. That person is dead, the things I did. But somebody said, oh, but you have a tattoo on your arm or something like that. No, you can see what you want to see. It's not there. Amen. You can see it's not there because that person is that dead. Is. You looking at, I now live after the spirit. So if you want to look at my flesh, that is fine. You want to look at what I did when I was 21, 22, 18, 16, 30, 95, whatever you want to look. But that day, that day when the Lord says, behold, I make all things new and you're a new creature. We walk after the spirit. Do not try to inveigle people to get in your flesh. The thing because you still want to have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And we're going to start calling it sharply. That is not so. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to implement steps for that individual to be suspended from teaching where they are. Might sound like a hard step, but yes, implement steps to suspend that person from doing this. God bless you, man. God. Amen. I love Christ. I love Christ. Yes, when, when you put on the, the, the first eyelash, and I'm the coat of eyebrow. You see? I'm post, I'm, 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 I'm put the, the, the ring in the middle, and then the mold. The girl satisfied with all God make them. They want to do the more thing, and that is not of God. We must do the right thing. Like the no mark on your body, we must do the right thing. And then we'll be at the type of part. The skinny pants show you I'm calling it with that. You want to see, you want to go. But I destroy you. Bishop, yes, yes, Bishop. Let me just read something to the record. 
I just want to read something into the record today. Yes. It's from Titus chapter 1, verses 7 through 13. Titus chapter 1, verses 7 through 13. Yes. It says, Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So I'm reading the scripture into the record today that we have it on record that we must rebuke this sharply before it spread further in the body of Christ. Amen. That was Titus. That was Titus chapter 1 and around 17 through 13. Let me just go back here real quick. Titus chapter 1, verse, verses 9 through 13. Nine. Let us take note of these scriptures, say to God, no way. Your notes. You can refer to them next time you have a conversation. Use the word. Use the word. Amen. God bless you. All right. So, moving on. Are there any other questions? Amen. I see a lot of folks on here tonight. Um, I have oh, a question. Okay. Brother Glenn. Yeah. Um, in the same scripture that we read first, Revelation 19, if you go in 15, and he said, and out of his mouth, God, God has short sword. That's really the to smite the nation. So, is this a story that come out of his mouth that came from his manual or? So, and we know that the Bible said a word, and so the right person was reading it, talking about it. I'm not going to it. So, they just think everything literal. I know the next time they're going to say, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of water. They're going to say, oh, what are going to flow from my belly? So, the Bible said, he that read, let him understand it. Okay, let's talk about that. Because if they're going to say, yeah, read another cause, if they're going to say, look, 16 and say, it's a tattoo. The way they look at 15, did your pastor they just jump right there and said, should ask the same question and say, is it a sword coming from his mouth? Amen. So, Absolutely, yeah. man of God. Yes. So I think people read the Bible and they just, that's why I said all the time, you can prove anything from the Bible if you take text or you talk. And then what the word of God is, you will be. Um, they see, and you will, see, and, and they will see many also because they're going to throw it and say, "He's right there." So that is just what you know. I have to say that if they go to number fifteen, then they will see that and go in their scripture and said, "The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword." And see, that is not the physical sword, but the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Thank you, man of God. Amen. Thank you, man of God. Because, um, as you said, out of his mouth proceeded a sharp sword. Now, are you telling me that a sword going to come out of the mouth of Jesus Christ? Are you going to be telling me that a sword is coming out of his mouth? What kind of sword? Explain that to me. It is speaking, as Elder Keith said, about the word of God. When we read the Bible says we must read with understanding. And the Bible says it must not be a novice 
when people are in certain offices and that's why we say sometimes we sound sharp and everything is for a reason we cannot allow novices because that will poison it will poison individuals saying oh it's okay cause jesus no jesus didn't do all those things that you are reading saying and handling the word of god deceitfully yes all have seen we all make mistakes there's none righteous so if i did something when i was young god forgave me for it and leave the scar i i i have scars on my hand right now when we were younger we were fighting i have scar they leave the scar but i'm a new creature the bible says they're gonna see him with the holes in his hands they're gonna see it that's the scar so if you did something don't try to justify it the father lord Help me to flee you for loss. Help me, Lord, and you have forgiven my sins. But we, Bishop, I'm charging you tonight. Elder Dennis, I'm charging you tonight. My God, Elder Glenn, Elder Knight, I'm charging you. And I'm asking you to charge me. To rebuke these things. Hold me accountable. Because the Lord knows I'm going to hold you accountable. Certain things we must not tolerate the body of Christ. As you can see, stuff is falling apart in the world. If the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? They are trying to destroy the foundations of the church. Minister Brown, I see your hand. Yeah, um, I think one of the things that is confusing a lot of people to is the different version of the Bible. Because you would go in one version and it might say something like that. Because mm -hmm. people do not want to read the King James Version because it's... But that's a version it, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's a little bit harder. So they tend to read um, the different version. And I'm telling you, those versions can tell, say something close to that. So I think it's a matter of also the, what they're reading to. So the point then, let me yeah. see if I can understand and respond to what Minister Brown said. The point is, we have to stop jumping from version sure. to version. It doesn't matter to me which version you select. I'm telling the truth. It does not matter to me which version you select. But when you don't like what is said in this version, then you go to the next version. So you're trying to please yourself. And I'm trying to please my... Take any version. However, we ask individuals, we say, if you're going to sit in a congregation... See what everybody is using and try to speak the same thing. Having the same mind, being of one accord. Let there be no divisions among you. But when you have like, if you've gone to church and heard the audience standing up to read and they're reading from seven different versions and folk were like, that's why they start putting the scriptures up on that big screen so that everybody so all of these are versions we don't have the original hebrew but we're saying use a common version among yourself and stop jumping around i don't like what niv says i don't like what the king james says i don't like what the uh, uh, young literal translation say so i'm gonna pick one that suit me no and we have to and we must and we will establish and stand upon the standards of god Bishop Stevens, back in your hand, man of God. Amen. That just basically answers the question. I just wanted to make, make a little point to that. Um, so, you know, oftentimes people don't want to look to God for a revelatory knowledge. So, again, that's part of the reason why they were running to a version like that man has broken down in your own evil mind. So, like you said, Edward, yes, one thing to use any version of church, but the authorized version. When you look at the authorized version, uh, coming down from when it was first translated or uh, transcribed into English, then if we stick to the authorized version and we find a scripture that we don't understand, then ask the Lord for regulatory knowledge. As opposed to running to another book that somebody said, well, I believe the Lord was trying to say this. You can't know the mind of God. You don't know what God was trying to say. So yes, if you run to another version and you say, well, now I understand. You believe you understand because it was changed. Did you get brother to down from God? Was it from the spirit? Or was it from man who gave him a perspective of what he thought it was? So yeah, very good that we are careful running from, from this version to that version. 
Okay, while Pastor Miles is searching for a question, I got one. Now, we know in the Old Testament, as far as Aaron goes, the Lord had decreed and the Lord had commanded that a certain garment be made for him and the sons of Levi and a crown for the high priest's head and all of that. What are the garments for the church? What the church now in the book of Leviticus and in the book of Numbers, it tells about the outfitting of the priests. What is the outfit for ministers of the gospel? And please supply me with scriptures telling me where the scriptures show what they should wear just like the scriptures describe what the priest should wear the high priest he had on robes and tunics and the poem and the thumim and stuff like that where in scripture does it outline and describe what garments ministers of jesus christ should wear anyone well, I believe it's uh, in, in uh, Ephesians 6, 
character. He talks about put on the whole armor of God. If you be able to stand in your stand, so we have the heaven of salvation, the blessed prayer of righteousness, the peace of God, the separation of the gospel, peace, the uh, support of the spirit. I believe those are the, uh, the priestly garments. All right. Excellent answer, Pastor Miles. So the helmet. So the Christian should wear a helmet of salvation. It's not physical. Breastplate of righteousness is not physical. Loins girded with truth. It's not physical. We see a class of persons that they dress and wear certain clothing and things like that. What is the origin? Is there any scriptural basis for that dress? Where did, where did it originate? Why is it done? What does it mean? So my question is, can anyone in scripture show me where the ministers of God are given instructions to dress in a certain way? As Pastor Miles says, they are, there is a spiritual dress, the whole armor of God. Elder Nigel um, texted. Now we're talking about the church now, Elder. In the church. All right, so you said Exodus 39. I don't know if you are saying the church. Exodus 39. Well, that's why I want to verify. Okay, because I did see how Aaron and his son should be dressed so he's giving us a scripture about the levitical order he's giving us the levitical order of how the priest of god should be dressed but the priesthood is now changed the priesthood is now changed we are not of the levitical order but of the melchizedek order melchizedek where is the dress for priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ being our high priest. How was Jesus identified when they came to take him? How did they distinguish Jesus? Judas what do you say, Minister Brown? Judas the only way they could identify Jesus. <laughs> Minister Brown said Judas had to kiss him. They couldn't differentiate him between him and the rest of the disciples, they all looked alike. Say again. The breastplate of righteousness. Uh huh. Jesus Christ, the Melchizedek order. So let me ask a different question. The attire of these ministers in fish act. Um, all these kind of coats and robes and things like that and not talking about academia not talking if somebody graduating from high school college or bible school or something like that. not talking about it i'm talking about folk dressing up in all kind of stuff and where did this come from it's in scripture it's actually in scripture the priest of baal so that's homework <laughs> no, that's what um, I, I, I want to say something with regards to the question. Yes, sir. And Pastor Mal, you know, we're really hitting the nail on the head with that. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4, I believe we're going to have to repeat it again. In Ephesians chapter 4, the word tells you in Ephesians 4 and verse 24 and 25. Um, let me start with verse 20. And be renewed of the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and fullness. So we are the, our garment is the righteousness of Christ. So we are we put on, and so because of because of the righteousness of Christ, but we put on we, are, we cover our bodies, not only to be presented presented ourselves in a decent way. Physically, we present our bodies decently, but we carry the righteousness of Christ that when we speak, people know who we are. Even when we when we dress, people know of who we are. 
so we will know us according to the way we speak, how we live, how we dress, how we act. And so it, it's a combination, but it, it's all by the Spirit. So it says in verse 25, we are going to put it away, lying, speaking, every man, truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So we are, we are wearing the righteousness, so we are covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is our garment. Our spiritual garment is the righteousness of Christ. But I do understand what you're saying, Brother Brown, that you know, we must present ourselves. By the said, we must present ourselves. Present ourselves. Can I add a scripture to that? Oh, absolutely. Isaiah 51 and 10. Isaiah 51 and 10 says, I will break in joy in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments. And as a bride adorns herself with her jewel. Now, when we look at the Esau, uh, that was part of the Greek God. And uh, of course, you know, Aaron had to wear that. He had to wear that robe. So those um, the stones that were set in the Esau represent, as you know, the children of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, but if you look at this picture right here, um, it also talks about jewels, you know, that he has adorned us uh, uh, as a bride with a jewel. We feel with her, her earrings on and, and, and her beautiful uh, head uh, got uh, jewels and uh, some of them bracelets and all this. So he gives us an image and a picture of how we as the children of God have clothed our we clothe ourselves in righteousness. We clothe ourselves in humility. We clothe ourselves um, in uh, you know, love, loving one another. So that's the scripture talk to the uh, to to uh pair with it. that priestly garment that Aaron and them need to have to wear. We are clothed that we have to put on suit, but they're spiritual garments. Amen. Okay. That is so true. Um if, if you would turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 10, 2 Kings chapter 10, begin reading Bishop Stevens, if you would, from verse 21. 2 Kings chapter 10. Amen. And Jehu said to all of Israel and all the worshippers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal. And the house of Baal was pulled from one end to another. And he said unto him, that was over the vestry, bring forth vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. And he brought them forth vestments. And Jehu went, and Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, into the house of Baal, and said unto the worshippers of Baal, Search and look that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshippers of Baal only. And when they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings, Jehu appointed four score men without and said, If any of the men whom I have brought up into your hands escape, he that lets him go, his life shall be for the life of him. Amen. So we want to pause there. So what we see, we must always research and study the origins of the things that we see, even in the house of God. They were offering burnt offerings, burnt sacrifices, and things like that. But they had a vestry. You won't find that anywhere in the church. You see these churches with, no, these churches with vestry, not under the Mel not under the Melchizedek order. Not under the Mel is of the temple of Baal. They are copying the things that they did when they were worshiping Baal 
and they are practicing them and telling us about this church and saying, okay, these are the choir robes. These are the ministerial garments. What you have right here, the ministers of God, the people of God did not identify themselves with these things. Only the worshipers of Baal. Now, what am I saying tonight? Yes, I'm coming right back to you, Mr. Brown. I'm saying, let us do some research on this because I'm asking different ones to show me under the Melchizedek order where we are given instructions on the vestments that we're going to get from the vestry and how we ought to dress. You had your hand up. Yes, yeah, so I just have a question because you mentioned about the fire robe. Um, so you're saying that um, that's not something that um, the church should be wearing? Not necessarily. What I'm saying is prove to me from scripture that's something we should be doing. I'm not saying okay. that okay. it's not. Again, let me just repeat that for clarity's sake. What I'm saying here is that it was shown that the worshippers of Baal, they would have different categories. They would have the Vestal Virgins. They would have the Masters. They would have uh, what they call the altar boys or the eunuchs or whatever they have. And they would dress according to different colors. So I'm saying, and the priests would have there so you would know which one is which one. So I'm saying, just show from scripture why we do these things. How did it originate? The Bible says salvation is of the Jews, right? Yeah. Salvation. Was this something that was done in the Jewish temple? And again, it's a question. It's to challenge us to search the scriptures. Is it something that was done in the church? Show me. The Bible says prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. You see these preachers going around now. All of them dressing like the Pope. Some of them have some big kind of like rods and hats and all kind of stuff dressing up like magicians show me where in scripture the bible says make everything after the pattern that i've shown you in the mountain it's a question it's a challenge i'm saying to me prove it i just gave my scripture my scripture is the worshipers of Baal and all these garments that they wore. I'm just using that scripture. I'm saying, now somebody must show me in the church how we ended up doing those things. But I'm going to say for the choir. Say it louder. <laughs> hey, don't be here talking underneath okay, so your I'm breath. I'm going to say for the choir, it's the matter of uniform where everybody looks the same. And yes, one could say, why not wear a black shirt or a white shirt and everybody would look uniform another thing that i like about the choir especially in these last days people do not know how to dress and talking about sorry, the robe, the, robe, the, the choir, choir robe. robe and especially the ladies they do not know how to dress and we had an issue where in in in, in our church where this is the reason why they wanted us to wear um the robe because People were dressing inappropriate, and then you're standing there, you're ministering, and the, these men, for the women, are looking. So in order not to cause that distraction, they they do the robe, and I like that. All right, so let me ask it's you a question. It's not from scripture. I'm just saying. You Fine. Want, right. One could look at it from probably that point of view. Fine. I'm agreeing with you. So you're saying they should cover them up when they in the assembly. It should cover up everywhere. But oh, so they leave the robes in the vestry at the church. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just being an advocate now, trying to show you what's going on. What we need to do is to teach modesty. Modesty must be pervasive throughout our life. It must be that we dress modestly everywhere, because they could put on a hundred choir robes when they gather together and then after the service they take them off isn't it the same problem but it's less distraction i believe it's less distraction in the assembly in the assembly have you ever walked down the street and see some of these young ladies oh yes oh yes well that's what we're working on we're not working on in the building like somebody say you're preaching to the choir we're talking about when they come out here we are in hot pants 
when you're driving your brand new car and folk wearing some kind of clothes that make you wanna, you know, let me stop. Bishop Stevens. So we see we are by the cause of them after. Matter of fact, let me let me go this like we are we're here and so we have a, a broad understanding. Um and in Jonah chapter three, in Jonah chapter three, verse five and six, the Bible says, So the people of Nineveh believed in God. That's after they were the one and teaching and proclaim a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even the least of them for word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes now i know that that was a that was a, a, a process and the way that they did it back in the older days uh, the, the, the the idea here we, we're looking at here is that when the word of God comes to God to make a change in their life, um, there are certain things that we go along with. We, we, we take off some clothing, we make a change in how you dress, how you speak. Exactly sort of what I was to my point earlier from Ephesians chapter 4. You make a change in your clothing, you make a change in your speaking, in your actions, in your lifestyle. So the change came, and now you must make a change in your ways of life, actions, clothing, speech, uh, your, your performance. So now you are a new creature in Christ, the whole thing God has to be. Bishop Stevens, I'm glad you went there. I am glad you went there. I wasn't ready to go there yet, but you went there. So since you, you know, went there, could you read for me Revelation chapter 11? Verses three through six. Three through six. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. Clothe in sackcloth. <laughs> <laughs> These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. Standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hear fire proceeded out of their mouth and devoured their enemies, and if any man will hear them, he must in this manner be killed. These are come to shut up heaven that is reigned not in the days of their prophecy and have power over water to carry them blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Thank you, man of God. So, what the word is saying in terms of the dress for the church, he is saying it's a clothes, a, a clothing of humility, yes. modesty, modest apparel. The word uses sackcloth. Not expensive dress of garment. Or, oh, my child of the king, I got to look royal. I'm a this and I'm a that and all that kind of stuff. It's talking about the people of God now. The true people of God. They say they're going to be clothed in sackcloth. Please do, yes. Is it there a part in the scripture where the Lord said that we're supposed to take up him, take up him and learn of him because he's meek and lowly in heart? Exactly. Learn, for I am meek and lowly. This kind of put on folk walking around talking about. Bishop, can you just take over? Let me just jump in here for a second. You are so right, Mr. Corona. Hey, listen to my friend Mikey. Go, go, go. They go back to my home. Miss Brown said they could not identify Jesus Christ, but they came from the garden. They couldn't identify him 
because everyone was dressed in the same manner. No one knew who he was. No one knew who he was. The Bible said, and he found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and took on the form of a man. So Jesus came in the, Jesus came in the form of a man. He wore clothing that you and I would wear. You know, just normal clothing. He didn't stand out among the crowd. He wasn't trying to put on vestures of, of, of so-called righteousness. He was righteousness. So you are right, Mr. Corona. Yes, he's meek and lowly, and it's, it's a stance of humility. This is where the church should stand, in humility. I can say one cannot, cannot make himself look good. Yes, proper, he said. But don't try to overdo it. Is your heart right with God? So thank you for this Sister Andrew, why, why all the time you make trouble, so? Why, why are you going to go start trouble now? That's where I'm going, and you see, look, you just turned the whole thing upside down now. So you saw where I was going. <laughs> you saw where I was going. And the sign that they got for their car saying clergy. That means they must get special privileges. And they got some thrones that they sit up and the regular people got to sit on a plastic chair and a metal chair. Sister Andrew, why are you starting trouble? I'm just asking. You know, no, I'm asking because I'm saying Jesus Christ, who is God, we know that. He is 100% God, 100%. Show the human Who that? They had to get close to somebody who somebody that was close to him to even know who Jesus was. They could have only tell you based on the authority that he spoke with them. You're in this company and you're hearing him, then those come up to me power. So it's about what is in him and the demonstration of power and authority. So the sisters have been wearing TVs and jeans and jeans and teachers, then that's how Jesus will move. So, you know, all these special head tables and, you know, special things for special that I'm just saying. No, you're making trouble. <laughs> because now you let me have to go to this verse. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 15. Ezekiel chapter 3. So I want to figure that out too. You want to read it for us, Bishop? Yes, yes. Yes, Ezekiel chapter um, 3. You want to start? Give me context so that from 14 and 15. Right. And, right. and so the Spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. For the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Labi, that dwelt by the river of Sheba. And I sat there where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. Could you give me verse 15 again, Bishop? Slowly. Verse 15. Then, then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Abib, that dwelt by the river of Sheba. And I sat where they sat and remained there as among them seven days. You notice what the prophet did? He was a prophet and he was a priest. He said, I sat where they sat. Why is it you got to have some special seed? Why is it you have? No, the word says the spirit was upon him. 
So the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Aviv that dwelt by the river of Chebar. And I sat where they sat. Why you can't sit where everybody else sit? Why you got to have a big throne seat with big cushion, with devil over it? Why your seat got to be different? Thank you, Bishop leave Stevens. Let's see what Sister Andrew did now. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. So let So let me ask you a question, Elder. Chairs inside of it, there is nothing wrong with that. So, why, why is it that we have good chairs inside of our house? Why is it that we're at the table? All right, Elder. So, let me ask you a question right now then. Why they can't have similar chairs for everyone? For everybody else. But the thing is, that that's what I'm trying to let, I, I, I'm trying to say to you guys. Why is it that um, if, if you have a church, because if I, I see people with their churches. And, and they have the, the, the chair. Yes, some people go overboard with the chair with the lion head and all of that. That's what we're saying. Some of them are going overboard. But there is nothing wrong with you having a church and having comfortable chairs on the pulpit. For everybody. For, 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 for the, the, the ministers and whosoever to sit down. You have to have comfortable chairs inside of the church. For everybody, so though. Wrong with it. The one with the lion head and the one with all of this stuff and all of that. That's when uh, I have a problem with that. But they have to be comfort for everybody because the Bible says like priests, like people, and there's no difference. Like priests, like no. people, and there is no you know difference. You, you want to hear the funniest thing? Yes, sir. I want to tell you guys the funniest thing. You know, a lot of times no. in churches, it's not the pastor or the bishop by the chair that there's the thing. Is the member of the congregation go out and buy them here and put it inside here? So let me ask you a question, Elder. And they buy it for the bishop, but what happened to the other people? But that's what I'm trying to say. To so you. they gotta sit on a metal chair. Elder Brown, Elder Brown. They gotta sit on a yes, metal yes, chair. Have here. And yes, I understand what everybody is saying. But if I take it up on myself. To go and buy you a chair for the restroom for you to sit in. You cannot play. I then the congregation cannot turn around and blame you because you were the one that buy. It. But I now have to say to the individual buying it that there is no difference between priests and people. So instead of we buying, can say that now. Huh? Can I jump say in that now? Absolutely. Because Please I'm jump in. I've seen it happen, and I, I never hear nobody say 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 to the congregation, um, or, or say to the individual. So the thing that we have to understand is that if we are not careful, we can use cheers and all of these stuff and drive people out of church. Hello. I'm gonna I come back. Go ahead, Bishop. I'm gonna come back to it. I, I, I I'm, I'm hoping Hello, you didn't miss the, the point. I, I truly hope you didn't miss the point. Let me, let me bring it to a scripture and we look at it together so we can bring some context to what, what is being said here. The book of James, book of James 2 and verse 2 and 3 tells us something. It reads, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in, God, in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that wear the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit down here in a good place and say to the poor, stand up, stand down there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves? And are become judges of evil thoughts? So, Elder, Elder, what we are trying to say is this very clearly. What is stopping them? If they can give, if they can give certain leaders. Those big gold chairs to sit on. The biggest chair, the most expensive chair. What message are they sending? Are you saying that these are the angels of the church? No, we've heard that saying. These are lords 
Jesus said, one second, one second. Jesus said to the disciples, he told them that the, that the, that is the Pharisees, they have dominion, right? Over, I'm sorry, let me, let me get it right. Elder, Elder Brown, head down to you. Yeah, the lords, the lords of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. He says, but among you it shall not be so. The Lord said, don't do it. Don't do it. So there's nothing wrong with a nice chair in the pulpit. But make some nice chairs in the pews. But they get carried away. And I know what you say. saying. I can even describe it. Some have a, have a, have a, a lion head. Some have a big star on it. Cushion. Um, let me just jump in here with a scripture now. All right. Everybody I've heard of pastor's aid. All of us, and I see your hand, Sister Andrea. All of us have heard of pastor's aid who have gone to church. Have you ever heard about them taking up a weekly offering for the saints? Anybody? Let me read what the scripture says. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. First Corinthians. Bishop, could you read it for me, sir? I got it. Go ahead, sir. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. You notice what he said? Every month they have pastors here and take up collection for the pastor and get him a big cheer. And a big nice car with a sign and stuff. And you never, you know what they said? They never read that one. They never said, okay, every week we must take up an offering for the saints. He says, no, concerning the collection for the saints, not the pastor now. As I have given order, he gave an order. I'm talking about scripture now. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. He says, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God had prospered him that when, that there be no gatherings when I come. So the ones preaching put themselves in a position where they have a position of dominance and they sit in these chairs and they put the, the, the rest of the seats as a metal chair for three hours uncomfortable while you sit up here in a, while they sit up there in a comfortable chair like this. No, the Bible says I sat where they sat and like priests, like people and bishop read the scriptures and the scriptures say to us that there shall be no partiality in the house of God. Sit where the rest of people them sit. I see you and Minister Andrea. No, and um, in the book of Acts, when we look how the church was established, right? When the conscience were pricked and they got saved, they sold what they had, right? They have all things in common, right? Wait, 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 so, Sister Andrew, you did the same thing again that you did before, you know. Why do you have to say they have all things in common? I want you to read it because that's the church that Jesus established. Tell me where that is for. Let me see if that is true. What verse? Acts chapter what? Acts chapter two. two they are the end. You mean yes. all the church and all things in common? Yes, they did. And none said this was my. My let me no, just no 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 idea. Let me let me let me just find that because you making problems now. It says Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 45. Mm -hmm. 44. And all that believe, and all that believe were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from host to host, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So you can sit anywhere. You can sit because they had all things in common. And um, before that, the prayer before that, because when read a verse before that as well. The verse before that says verse yeah. 43. Yeah. 40. Let me start with 40. Yeah. It says, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. 
Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together, and had all things common. No partiality in the house of God. No special privileges. Hello? Yes, Pastor Miles. I have a question. And my question is, then when Paul um, tells the people, I believe it's Hebrews 13, is it Hebrews 13, 7, where he said, he, he tells them, well, let's go to 1 Timothy 2. And by a first Timothy, I think it's first fifth, excuse me, first Timothy, the fifth chapter, and about the third verse, and, and uh, he says as well, it goes out uh, to give double honor mm -hmm. uh, to the elders. And uh, no, show me the verse. So I, I don't. Labor, once you know to labor in the word. One second, Pastor so Max. Pastor Max. The verse you just gave me yes. said, honor widows that are widows indeed. So you want the one that says, um, honor, double honor it's to the right. elders. Hold on one second. Uh -huh. it, it, what is it? The third verse? Okay, I'm going to But you're right there. If you read that next verse, I believe. It's First it Timothy says, 5, 17. Give honor, double, double honor to, and I'll find it for you. Double honor to, uh, those who preach and teach the gospel. First Timothy 5, verse 17. Yes. Pastor Miles? Yes. It says, First Timothy 5, 17. Let me read it for you. Let the no, 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 no. Not 5, 17. No. It's First Timothy 5, uh, what does 4 say? Let me get here. But the it one, 17 double said double honor. Yes. So, so that's what I was. Give me one second. Let me read it. Give me a second. Let me read it. So you hear. It says, "Let the elders that rule well be counted, be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine." Yes. So if you go there with the mindset of uh, people up to date, that honor. It's why they give them them high chairs. It's why they, they usher them up. Because Paul now interjects after the book of Acts where they had all this common. What are you talking about all this honor? And he also says that I read this in Hebrew, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 13 7, where he talks about to, uh, you know, submit to those who have uh, authority over you, but they watch out for your soul. And he, he, he is the one showing you to give all of this. Um, not just to um, what we call the lay people, but he's making a distinction. Okay, Pastor Ma, so, so let's let's go back there, and I'm going to ask you to read it for me. Let's go back to that passage that we just mentioned, and I'm going to ask you to read it for me. Verse 17. Uh, Hebrews uh, 13, 17? No, 1 Timothy 5, 17. Okay, because that's okay. First Timothy, I'm still looking now because my eyes ain't working too good. You want to help me read it, Bishop? Uh, it's yes, First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 5. Verse 17. Read verse 17. That the elders rule well. Yes. I have to count it. I have to. Start over again, Bishop. I'm sorry. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Okay, so Pastor Mas, he's saying, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy. Note that word. They are worthy, worthy. of double honor. He didn't say given. He said they are worthy of it. He says, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So let me show you what Paul said later. He says, I use none of these things. He, he, doesn't, doesn't, say 
So what does honor mean? What does honor mean? Okay, give me give me one second. Just give me one second. So here, First Corinthians nine, in First Corinthians nine, verses fourteen and fifteen, Bishop. First Corinthians nine. You want to start with thirteen, so we got context. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse thirteen, and it reads. Do ye not know that which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so, had the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Verse 15 now. Uh, Slowly, so we hear it. But I have used none of these things. Neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it is for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in boy. Okay, Pastor Matt, so let me come back to this. Here Paul was saying that the Lord ordained that those who minister about holy things should live of the things of the temple. And those which wait at the altar are partakers of the altar. But we saw in the church, they had all things common. They had equal shares. So Paul was now saying, even so are the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel because they're preaching it. But verse 15, he says, but I have used none of these things. Neither have I written these things that it should be sold on unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. So though they should be counted worthy of double honor, they had all things common. They didn't get twice as much. Paul says, I didn't even take my share. Sister Andrew, yes. Okay. When Paul was saying to live off the gospel, Mm -hmm. was it for financial gain? Not for would, you in that, would you look at it in that light? No, not for gain. But what he was saying was the preachers now, and that is their full time. That is what they are doing. He is saying God ordained that they should be compensated for their time. Mm-hmm. But the same compensa- compensation that is given to everyone else. Yes. Not a special, he says, collection for the saints. So not a special, oh, we're going to give you three times or four times. And then somebody is neglected. That's why they appointed the deacons because the Hebrew widows were being blessed and the Grecian widows were being neglected. So they selected seven deacons so that they might be an equitable distribution. No special persons in church. The Bible says, God is no respecter of persons. Person. And then Paul aboard with Aquila and Priscilla because they were tent makers. So he told you that Paul had a job. So Paul was doing yeah. it. He did right. He was not there. And he was preaching the gospel too. Amen. Absolutely. But what he was also saying, those that minister, and this is their... This is what God has put them to now. And some say the apostle and I've heard some say they're not working anymore and all kind of stuff. And I'm not fighting with if you if you tell me you're an apostle, I'm not gonna fight with you. That's between you and God. You see what I'm saying? And if you say you must be called apostle, I ain't gonna fight with you. I no quarrel with you. That's between you and God because God says some of them claiming to be apostles are false and stuff. So you sort that out when you are laboring in the gospel. He says, you are worthy. I know people who have driven their personal cars, people who have gone and labor and they give and they put in and stuff like that. And they they are worthy of it. And it's our obligation and our duty to compensate these people just like everybody else. Yes, ma'am. I met this young man, young preacher, in his 36 children. He doesn't work, the wife doesn't work. You have poor people in your congregation. I know somebody like that. And I'm saying to myself, what pressure 
is being placed. So I said, do you have a house? Do you own a home? Right? And he was here visiting, but had all these stuff that he needed. And I'm like, how can this be? You have six children. You're young, your wife is young, right? And you, who is going to take up all of this burden? And your, your assembly, the people are not like wealthy people. Pastors aid, they tell you. They say pastors aid. But saints in the church with the same conditions, the same situations. That's my point, Elder Brown. That's exactly my point. Thank you. So who is responsible for your family? You sit and you make six children living in red holes. Right? Plus church expense. You don't work, your wife don't work. And I'm saying, if this not God, who so, tell you to stay home and don't work? So, and that's what I said to, you know, a certain friend of mine. I explained to him, if you say the Lord call you and he said you there and, you know, the job is calling you and different things and you don't want to. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying people who have done their time, have labored, have done what they're supposed to do and all that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that. God forbid. I am not forbid because I know people getting up every morning and go to work and they come back here every day and they're on a program and they labor and stuff like that. And when they, they labor and they give and they do all these things, they are worthy. And that's one of the reasons we say we're not going to give a landlord eight. We were giving the landlord eight hundred dollars every month, and we could only use the building one time a week. That don't make any kind of sense. It don't make any kind of sense. So what we have to do is do what is right. We don't need a fifty thousand dollar car, and the people standing outside in the cold. That is wrong. That is wrong. We don't need church vehicles where we park them in the daytime. When the saints have to go stand at the bus stop waiting for the bus, take the church bus and drop off all the members that need to go to uh, their jobs. You know, well, let me stop before I get myself in trouble. <laughs> go ahead, Bishop. Uh, you know, you know, listen. I, I saw a video. You know, um, to, to what you were just saying, I saw a video uh, of um, all the church people was attacking the pastor. He showed up Sunday morning to the church, and I. You know, I don't want anyone to think or they're not putting violence out there at all. Uh, you know, the pastor showed up Sunday morning in this big, beautiful, white Range Rover. Um, it's a poor church, it's a small church. And he showed up in a Range Rover and people are now questioning, how come the church needs work and the church needs to be fixed? And they, but they come in a brand new Range Rover. Now, even if that pastor had used his own money to buy that, that car, it's not this one. It's not wisdom to show up at a church in a range over that's a hundred thousand dollar car. And the camera it's in the church, and you have poor people in the church. Uh Bishop, not even not even the church address the needs of the saints. I have scripture for it. First Corinthians <laughs> chapter 16, verse 1. No concern in the collection for the saints. Just like you have pastors eight Sunday. I've seen eight Sunday, and I'm not afraid to preach it anywhere. I've gone in the church and said it. I've offerings for the saints. Some saints can't collect welfare. They can't collect unemployment. They can't, uh, and you're going to say, oh, let them go on unemployment. That's wrong. And I will stand up for what is right without fear or favor. I'm going to stand up for what is right. They had all things common, and God is no respecter of persons and also and uh, if i may add to that you know if one wants to give a free will offering to the church let it be so now what, it, but it also i believe it, i believe that there is a responsibility on the part of the leadership to be careful now how that money is spent say to them listen all right don't come buy me a car don't buy me a big chair don't buy me expensive clothing and let's use this money to distribute it amongst in the, the common and, exactly and, and help to build up the church mm -hmm. you know, when we leave here you what know, are we leaving behind what are we going to leave behind everything we're going to leave that building, we're going to leave that building mm -hmm. you know all we have all we can leave behind is a good legacy in christ that we have laid a foundation that others can see and learn from it so if one wants to give a free will offer we are saying you by all means, 
You know, you can take, you can. But you, it's you for the whole it. church. But it goes to everyone. Amen. Common. They had all things common. So if we're gonna sit on a metal chair, all of us have a metal chair. If we're gonna sit on a padded bench, then they take one of the pad bench and put on the pulpit, like priests, like people. They all sit in. No, you're not gonna put three thrones up there. I'm gonna put three thrones and I'm gonna sit in a throne. And they're sitting on some talk to me and that's exactly what they're using it to me. And, 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 all the fish and the lobster and the chicken, but the brown of six meat on his plate, and then the poor people in the church, the people who need the food the most, who, who's going home and walking it, you know. They turn over the back of the chicken and give give it to that's wrong. The, the, the people that is less fortunate. One more quick thing, and the people must eat first. Yeah. The pe the shepherd don't eat before the sheep. <laughs> the shepherd must feed the sheep. Thank the you. Should be, the pastor should be helping to feed them. You know, the pastor should be helping to feed them. Listen, I agree. Double honor. What does honor mean? Honor means That's to what give I'm saying respect. Exactly. Give respect. To give respect. Not material thing necessarily. Not even material thing respect. In the presence of your bishop, your pastor, there is a certain aura of decency, respect. You know, there was a time when people had shame, you know, people respected their pastor, their bishop, their, even their own brethren. I would I would dare not speak like like in a certain way and the church would hear me speak. So we have we give respect and honor to the children of God. But I must say this one thing. I've been to churches with the with the with the cheers on the altar, where the pastors sit, where the where the uh, the choirs members sit. They are all the same, and the weird the same. They are all the same. Me too. All the cheers Me too. Are the same in the church. Me but too. They are separated by 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 ministry. You know the leaders, the choir, the assembly. But they all sit on the same size chair, the same color, the same price. Nothing is different. All things come. And all wisdom, things come. Of the course. Leadership doesn't use wisdom. All things come. Amen. Thank you, Minnie God. Our time is almost gone. Amen. Amen. Are there any more questions before we close? If not, Thank you, Pastor Miles and Minister Brown and Bishop Stevens and Ella Dennis. Amen. Ella Pete, Glenn, Minister Andrew, Mother Grant, Minister Corona, Minister Sakina, Sister Mary, Minister Ermine, Elder Nigel, Pastor Miles, Minister Alita. Yes, and Elder Glenn. Thank all of you, Minister Paul Brown. Thank all of you. The Bible says the Lords of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, but among us. It must not be so. Uh, we have seen many that have set up and gone into the church business so that they can have um, what we should say the amenities or they could have um, the trappings of the church and mislead many. But we see that today we're going to be charging everybody like priests, like people, and God is no respecter of persons. So we have to get ourselves right where we're going to learn to respect one another. We're going to learn, the Bible says, submitting yourselves one to the other in the fear of God, loving one another, caring for the least member, just like, oh, we want to be cared for, just like, oh, I want to be cared for. Um, Minister Miles and Minister Leet and Minister Sakim and Bishop Stevens, and we all the same and there is no exception for god is no respect of persons back into your hands bishop stevens and we close as we close first corinthians 14 verse 40 tells us that all things be done decently and in order and if i may ask um minister and dream could you close us out in prayer in the name of jesus christ Thank you, Jesus. We just thank you, Holy Spirit, for this teaching. We thank you, O oh God, for some of strength. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you told us that we should, O oh God, exalt 
our brethren above ourselves. It takes humility to do that. So we ask you, oh God, to be for that love and humility that we have all things in common, oh God. The spirit of division and preferential treatment, Father, we know it's not all to be so. Lord God, a lot of people have come into your house and they feel rejected and outcast because of what is happening in the assembly. So we thank you today for sound doctrine, for bringing us back to the foundation, to the old landmark, the principle that you have established, Lord Jesus. We come against the spirit of pride and haughtiness, Lord Jesus. It's one body. And you told us, over oh that the head is not different from the comely parts. Help us, Jesus, to walk in lowliness and meekness. You show us the example, Lord God. Help us to come back to that place where we recognize that we are ministers of reconciliation. For us to be great, Lord Jesus, we must bring ourselves down to be servants, Lord God. Help us to understand what it means to honor and to truly love. We ask you that your love will be in our heart. And we pray for forgiveness, oh God, for mistreating one another, oh God, for wanting people to push us up when you are telling us to come down. So we thank you tonight, oh God, for everything that was being said and done, that Lord God we will care with a tender heart, Lord Jesus, that people will see the love of you manifested, oh God, through us. We ask you for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We thank you, oh God, for these men and women who try to bring truth and sound doctrine in a world, oh God, that is so boastful, pride, lust, oh God, everybody wanting to do their own. So we ask you today that we will come back to Jerusalem and Father, we will come in one accord that your Holy Spirit can anoint us afresh, that we yes. can go out, Lord Jesus, and to establish your kingdom. Let your will be done, O oh God. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. We thank you for your mercy, O oh God, that we have today, this minute, this hour, to get it right. Help us, Jesus. Have your way in our lives. Cover us under your blood, Lord God. Seal us under your blood. Protect our families and our loved ones. And Father, let unity, let the unity of the Spirit be in us. Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please Amen. join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. as we begin our foreign missions. Amen. We thank you, those who are on Facebook tonight joining us we hope that you have heard and learned something tonight and those who are on the zoom link tonight we hope that you have heard and have learned something tonight we thank all of you for your questions for the we, we, we thank god for the biblical response the biblical answers amen and for those who disagree we respect the disagree amen we respectfully accept and understand but this is the reason why we said let's use the scriptures so when we use the scripture, then you have to talk to God about it. So we will not, you can't charge God foolishly. You know, so everyone, we thank you for being a part of this. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful evening. In your hands of the world. Amen. Nothing more to be said, Bishop. If you would just dismiss us as we play this song, the reason why I'm living this life. Please dismiss us, man of God. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let everyone say, Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank all of you. Thank each and every one of you for an excellent discussion. Beloved, we are going to have to give an account for every word that we speak. So we have to be careful what we say. Thank all of you for sticking to the word of God. The reason I'm living this life, <laughs> I can't afford it. I don't want to be lost. 
God bless you. Thank all our viewers on Facebook tonight. Thank you on Facebook, YouTube, Zoom. Amen. God bless you all. Goodbye, all. God bless you. Amen. I don't want to be lost. Amen. God bless you all.